good morning. morning. I think Ashley's glad to be here. Anybody else glad to be here? Good, good morning. Awesome. Good. Ashley's also still glad to be here. Uh, man, I'm so glad to be with you guys uh, today. As Ashley said, my name is Pat. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I'd love the privilege to meet you. Um, and then the whole second row there is the Gillen row uh, today. So I'm um, glad to have them with us today. Ashley, in the first service, uh, mentioned that my daughter uh, was, he was my daughter's coach. Every now and then I call him coach. And uh, there's also another nickname that I uh, usually call him around uh, the office that Carrie likes to call him too. And uh, so I thought that's what he was going to say. And I just turned red as he was saying, yeah, Pat <laughs> calls me this nickname around the office. So uh, if you want to know what that is, you can ask Carrie later. If you don't already know, um, she, she's probably less afraid to say it in public than I am. But um, Truly love Ashley, and I know you guys know how blessed you are. Um, just, just an amazing man of God, and um, love, love serving with him. I actually still remember one of the first uh, lunches I went out with anybody on staff was with him and another staff member to Wild or uh, no, the Wing Place, um, Quaker State, uh, Quaker Steak and Lube. And uh, that was that was like almost eight years ago, and I, I just remember him having an impact even then. And uh, man, just absolutely uh, love serving with this guy. Turn to Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter four. Uh, looking forward to uh, continuing this series. Do want to let you know we're after today a third of the way through Revelation. So that is either super exciting to you or uh, super bummer. I don't know, uh, but we're a third of the way through. I feel like we just got started, uh, but there is so much that's about to happen in Revelation as well. Today is really uh, going to be the start of that turn that's happening in Revelation. We've been talking about uh, the seven churches the past couple weeks, which is, uh, to me, my favorite part of preaching Revelation. I didn't even get to preach it. Um, so uh, just uh, it's been incredible as we walk through it uh, together as a church to see that. And I know um, we focused on two churches in particular, and then uh, last week spoke, uh, focused uh, primarily on the church to Laodicea and um, how they were neither hot nor cold, but they were lukewarm. And uh, such, a, such a great reminder to us, uh, just as we look at where we're at, that as John is, is penning these words and he, and he talks to these churches, I love that actually at the end of chapter three, uh, there's the quintessential verse of Jesus saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Uh, and if anybody hears my voice and lets me in, I'll come eat with him and dine with him. Um, it's, it's kind of this cool picture. And we use that, that verse evangelistically a lot, or at least you probably heard it used, right? Like Jesus is standing at the, the door of your heart. And if you'll just open and let him in, he'll come and dine with you. But the, the cool part is that contextually, he's actually speaking to the church. When the church is mentioned in scripture, it's always a body of believers or people. It's not a building. It's not a 501c3. And I know those things exist. But the church is a people. Um, upstate church is a people, right? And if, if this campus and all of our campuses just crumble to the ground tomorrow for some reason, the upstate church still exists because you're upstate church. I'm upstate church. We are the church that God has called us to, right? So when he's speaking to the church at Laodicea, he's speaking to the people of God and he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock if you'll let me in. He's reminding us as believers, man, Love me, let me in, let me rule your life, submit to me. This, this kind of mindset as we move and shift into chapter four is that Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And now John, all of a sudden in chapter four, is, is whisked into this heavenly view, this picture of Jesus um, and, and God on the throne, this, this, this amazing, uh, we're gonna read it in a second, uh, amazing thing that's actually uh, almost in some ways confusing for us as we get there, but the key and the core of it is Jesus' words, I'm standing at the door and knocking, and if you'll let me in, I'll come eat with you. I'll come dwell with you. This, this picture of ultimately that's what it's about. I think sometimes we read Revelation, and I'm sure you've heard it preached this way, uh, where it's like a code to crack, right? And people are like, all right, you know, we're going through this. This is Iran, and then uh, this one's going to be Russia. And as we look through this, the Antichrist is going to come from this place. And you probably even read those books left behind. I definitely did when I was uh, in high school and um, watched at least, at least one of those movies or maybe a couple. Um, not the Nicolas Cage version, uh, for sure. I think we can get in this and we can start thinking like, what's the code to crack? What are the things we need to figure out? Let me just kind of, let me just kind of take that off the table for a second. That's, that's not what I'm here to do is to speculate 
on what this could be. What we are going to do is look at scripture for what it says and contextually what it says through other things in the Bible, how a first generation or a first Christian, uh, first century Christian might actually be hearing this and viewing this. And that changes the way that we even interpret it ourselves. So we look at the Bible with our 2024 eyes, right? Um, we look at the Bible uh, sitting in our recliner with our cup of coffee in our hand and our air conditioning. If you're in, if you're in first century, like Middle East, this is a, a whole different situation. In fact, most of the Christians of that day, they, they weren't just enjoying their life and sitting in their recliner and having a coffee. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, all of that's true of me except for the coffee part. But it, the, the thing that's different about them is they were actually facing persecution or certain death. Like for them to follow Jesus in the first century, they were immediately sensing some pushback. So to follow Jesus almost meant I'm putting my life on the line. I need some, I need to know this is true. I need to believe it. And there's a part of us as believers almost just today where we just look at our faith as such a casual thing. The first century believer would not have had a casual faith. They would have had a, a dedicated faith to Christ. They would have said, man, we don't want to be that lukewarm church. And so Jesus had really turned these ideas on, on its head um, as we look at this. And I, I think it's easy for us to start thinking, well, there's a book called Bible Codes and this is, explains this. I, look, that's, that's great. You, we can talk about that. And I know Ashley loves that conversation. You can talk to him all day about it. Um, but, uh, but this is, in many ways for us, a display of today we're especially how great God is and how amazing Jesus is. It's a reminder to us of that. I don't know if you're um, a spoiler person. Like I I don't like spoilers. Like some people are like, I, I need to know what's gonna happen before I watch this movie or whatever. It, I, I like to read trivia uh, when I'm watching a movie. So I'm the guy sitting with the IMDb app and before the previews, like just reading through the trivia. And then I'm like, Mel, this, the director of this movie also directed. And she's like, I don't care about any of that, right? I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then my son's like, he did what? You know, so that's great. I'm like, yeah, I'll share that with him. Um, and so, but when in the trivia section, it gets to a part that says spoilers. I, I don't read that until after the movie because I don't want to be spoiled. Um, and there is like a sense where I'm like, oh, it's right there, right? Like, but I, I don't want to be spoiled at all. And, and that's the absolute worst when somebody uh, spoils something. And let me just tell you, like sometimes we read Revelation and we're like, I don't know, are there spoilers? Are we about to see? Let me just tell you, the spoiler is that God is on his throne and he's in charge. That's the spoiler. The, the, the spoiler of this book is a reminder that he is all capable and that he is everything. That's the spoiler for Revelation. Our focus as we look at this is not to try and pull apart each little detail because there, we're gonna talk about that in a second, but our focus is to say, man, in, in this chapter, chapter four alone, there are 14 times the word throne is mentioned and over the course of the, the entire book, 46 times it talks about God's throne. When a throne is mentioned, that is the king is on his throne and he is ruling. We're talking about a God who is in charge. That's the spoiler. So the key word for us is throne, something we need to remember. And I think sometimes we gotta get down to the basics. Bottom line today is that Jesus is not the one of many. He is the one and only. And we live in a world where people wanna believe that truth is subjective that the things that we believe can be subjective, like that's, that's your truth, that's what you believe, I respect that, this is my truth, that works for you, this works for me. And that's not true. For something to be true, there has to be things that are false. And the problem with our world is that uh, this generation, especially below us, is, is being raised up in this subjective truth world to where it's causing all kinds of anxiety and depression, it's causing things because the very basics and, and fabric of even our physiology is being questioned and being put up for subjection to where it's like, if that's not true, if you're, if you're telling me that this is not a table, this world doesn't make sense to me. And so we ourselves are battling depression because we're seeking out truth where we should not find it. We've got to find and point people to truth in the word and truth in Jesus. That's where we're going. It, it, this, today is an impossible task to not offend somebody, Right. And that's the advantage of being bald. I can talk about bald people, you know? That's the advantage of being chunky. I can talk about chunky people and pick on them. Like there's some advantages we have when we're in that camp, but it's almost impossible to not offend somebody in our culture today. And that's because we, we're afraid to stand on truth because the world doesn't value it. 
And yet what we have today and what we're going to talk about is truth that we can live on. I want to talk about uh, chapter four, but we're really going to spend our time in chapter five today. So let me read chapter four, uh, one through eight, and then we'll do our best to kind of address some of these things. He says in verse one, after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this at once. I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven and one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on those thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature like the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes around them uh, within, saying, day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. What, what a picture, right? Can you imagine, like, you, you get whisked away into heaven, and all of a sudden, you're in front of this throne that is uh, glowing like um, Jasper and Carnelian. Anybody know what Carnelian looks like? Just uh, curious. Um, and, and this almost rainbow of emerald around it. And then there's 24 other thrones with elders on there. I don't know if that means they had white hair. And he's like, well, they're just old. But usually elders is a position of authority, not necessarily uh, an age. And then there were four beasts that had eyes everywhere, right? And even uh, the key word being like a lion, like an ox, um, with a face like a man, right? So um, this, there's this, there's this uh, almost symbolism that's happening there where John is doing his best to describe to his audience what he's seeing. He's, when he says, hey, there was uh, a glow of emerald around it, he's not saying there was actual emerald there. He's saying it looked like emerald. Now, maybe it is actual emerald. We don't know. But as we read this, what he's trying to picture for us is actually painting this story of what's happening. And as John has entered into heaven and he's whisked before the throne of God, what he sees is multiple thrones. And some people say the 24 elders represent the church kind of uh, with the 12 tribes of Israel doubled. There's a lot of numerology in Revelation that people read into. We do know that seven is the, is the number of perfection, right? So we see seven all the time. We're going to see seven uh, seals on a scroll. We're going to see uh, seven bowls. We're going to see all of that to come. But usually numbers in, in, uh, in Revelation are kind of multiples of seven or multiples of 12 because they symbolize those types of things. There's really not too much for us to read into here, right? It's just this picture of there are four creatures. We don't know what's going on with these creatures. There are 24 elders and there's this throne of God. But here's where the key is. In the midst of all that, they never cease day and night to say Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The beauty is that in this picture of essence of of what's going on is that all glory is being ascribed to who God is. Now in our lives, like we sometimes need to recognize or be, be reminded that everything we do should just be pointing to the fact that Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In spite of my weakness, in spite of my failures, I want to give him glory and him praise. I love this picture too of a rainbow around the throne because the rainbow is um, God's uh, way for us to be reminded of of even his judgment through the flood, right? And a reminder that's not gonna happen again. And so the rainbow appears after a storm. We have a big storm here. We may have a rainbow after, uh, and that's a reminder of God's uh, blessing uh, in that sense. Here, the rainbow appears before the storm, 
before the judgment's about to happen. In the next few chapters, as God begins to pour out his wrath, we see this rainbow appear beforehand. That's as an early uh, century, first century reader probably would have seen that. And again, those elders may symbolize the people of God in heaven, enthroned and rewarded, that uh, there were 24 courses of priests in the Old Testament. There's so many things that can point to that. But before God pours out his wrath, we get a glimpse into the glory that he experiences as he permits the angels or the angels and creatures praising him. And listen, heaven is a place of worship. If you don't like to worship, you're gonna, you're gonna hate heaven. That's what heaven's about. We're like, I'm gonna go, uh, me and Ashley are gonna go play you know, football uh, in the backyard, like in heaven. Like, listen, heaven is about focusing on our savior. Heaven is about worshiping the Lord. It's being in the presence of God and, and we're gonna worship him. For eternity, it's it's a place of worship. Now I know what like we talk about worship. This is just a side note. We talk about worship and we think, okay, we got three worship songs. Then we're gonna have some bald dude talk to us for a little bit. Uh, then we got another worship song, uh, and then we go home. But let me kind of re like direct the way that we think about worship. Wor- worship is the way that we live, just like these creatures, day and night, ascribing all of the glory to God in which He's due. In other words, we can do that through singing. We do that through opening the word and through the preaching of the word. We, we do that as we go eat lunch afterwards. We worship in the way that we live, in the way that we lift up and ascribe glory to God. Now, I'm not saying you have to walk around and people are like, what do you want for lunch? And you're like, holy, 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 it's the Lord God Almighty. But it means the, the way that we, in, in which we carry ourselves should be in worship. All right, so... Um, Let's, let's move on to chapter five. And the first point that I have for this is that he alone is worthy. In chapter five, let's read the first uh, eight, or excuse me, 10 verses together. He says, then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes that which are the spirit, seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For if you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Man, what a, what a cool picture. Again, John finds himself in this place, describes it to us with these creatures and elders. And then he discovers that there is Uh, a a scroll there. Now, uh, there's a few things that I want you to kind of be aware of. Jeremiah 32 talks about this scroll really as a written deed. It's uh, for for the first century um, person reading this or hearing this, for them, they would totally understand what that is. We don't use scrolls and seal them today. In fact, if somebody does that, um, it'd be a little odd, right? Like if that guy asks you out and is like, here, my lady, then run, right? (laughs) Like that's just stay away from that, uh, that guy. I'm giving you permission. But in this situation, like they have scrolls are a normal thing because what would happen is if you had a, a deed to a land, for instance, um, and something happened to you, that deed would be in that scroll and the only person worthy to open that scroll would be an heir of yours. So the person who would take that scroll and crack open the seal to get all that information would be the heir of that person. And Jeremiah kind of plays this out for us. So as this first century person is reading this, what we see is maybe this scroll has this picture of the, the, the earth and, and the people of God who, who are uh, represented in this scroll uh, that Jesus, or in, we, we come to see Jesus claims that no one else is worthy to open. 
Now, it's kind of interesting, I think, because it says both parts of the scroll, inside and outside, are written, which means it's complete. There's no space to add anything to it. There's no thing that you can put in there that isn't already in there that needs to be in there. And as this scroll is presented, there is not one person worthy on heaven, on earth, under the earth, who is capable of dealing with it. And so John begins to weep. Can you imagine even the pain that he was feeling in that moment? As they said, who is able to do this? And John, it says, began to weep loudly. Now, I thought about this maybe, maybe too much, but I'm like, John knew Jesus. God, God allowed him to, to, to see Jesus crucified and resurrected, and certainly there's got to be some dots connecting here, but in that moment, man, his, his emotions took over. None worthy, not Moses not Paul, not Billy Graham. There, there's no person on this earth or, or in heaven that is capable of opening the scroll. And then one of the elders looks over to him and says, weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered. There's so much right in, in there, enough to be said. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah was known as the lion. And you could see that back in Genesis uh, 28. We see that regularly, but I love this picture, man, of, of even the root of David, the Messiah who has come, the one who has fulfilled the prophecy can open the scroll. Man, this really cool um, quote uh, from W.A. Criswell I read, I know it's a long quote, quote um, but he says, John's, John's tears here represent the tears of all God's people through all of the centuries. The tears of the apostle John are the tears of Adam and Eve driven out of the garden as they bowed over the first uh, gra- bowed over the first grave as they watered the dust with the ground of the ground with their tears over the silent still form of their son Abel. Those are the tears of the children of Israel in bondage as they cried out to God in their affliction and savory. They're the tears of God's elect throughout the centuries as they cried unto heaven. They're the sobs and tears that have been wrung from the heart and soul of God's people as they looked upon their silent dead, as they stand beside their open graves and experience the trials and sufferings of life, heartaches and disappointments indescribable. Such is the curse that sin has laid upon God's beautiful creation. And this is the damnation of the hand of him who holds it, that usurper, the interloper, that intruder, the alien, the stranger, the Satan. And I wept audibly for the failure to find a redeemer meant that this earth is in its curse and consigned forever to death. It meant that death, sin, and damnation and hell should reign forever and ever and that the sovereignty of God's earth should remain forever in the hands of Satan. And then the elder leans over and says, weep no more. What a beautiful picture of hopelessness turning into hope. What a beautiful picture of sadness turning into joy. And man, we put so much hope into people. We put so much hope into elected officials. Every, I've been, I'm 43 years old. Every single election is like, this election's gonna be the one, guys. Like, we have to get out there. And, and I'm like, we've survived this far, okay? We, we've made it like this long. Um, I'm not saying election, voting's not important. Don't, don't come after me uh, later. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll set you up with somebody to talk about that if you want. But um, at the end of the day, like, we can sometimes focus so much on the temporary things of this earth that we forget the eternal. We forget the one who is perfect and sinless and who has the worthiness to open the scroll. scroll. Worthiness is something that we, um, we kind of deal with daily. Like we really, I feel like a lot of our life is dealing with, our, in some level, our own unworthiness. Even if you open up you know, Facebook or Instagram or whatever your, your poison is, and you're like looking at that and you're, you're just almost comparing yourself to other people, feel like I'm not, maybe I'm not worthy enough, right? Or um, even when we try to give compliments to somebody, we do this, and I know you've done this before, you've heard this, where you meet a friend of mine and you're like, man, you really outpunted your coverage when you married her, which is like saying, you're ugly, man. Like, <laughs> she, and I, I get we're trying to give her a compliment, but why we gotta do that by calling the man ugly, you know? Uh, you rarely see somebody that walks up and like, y'all are two beautiful people. I'm glad you find yourself. You found each other, you know? Like, that's great. Uh, that needs to happen more. That's all I'm saying. I'm, just, I'm throwing that out there. Um, saying that as a guy who out, 
kicked my coverage, but whatever. Um, some, we sometimes even with decisions, we're like, what gives that person the right, right? We're, we're constantly thinking about somebody's worthiness or unworthiness. And this is the illustration that um, Ashley mentioned earlier. I, I, do like, um, I do like Marvel uh, in game and before, right? Like past few years of Marvel has not been that great, uh, except for maybe Spider-Man. Um, but loved watching those with my son, still do. And there's a scene in an Avengers movie where they're all sitting around kind of hanging out and talking. If you're, not a, if you're not a Marvel person, all these are superheroes. And Thor has a hammer that only he is worthy to actually wield, right? And um, this hammer sitting on the table, wherever he puts it, it stays there. They're having this conversation. They all give it a try. They all try to move the hammer and nobody can move it. And, um, and so there's this funny scene where Captain America goes to move it and it, it wiggles just a little bit. And Thor's face, <laughs> Thor gets a little nervous as he sees that. He's like, okay, good. You know, he's still not worthy, it's fine. Um, and then as this Marvel progresses, there's so many different things. Thor actually upgrades to like this big ax and uh, Mjolnir, is the, the hammer is broken apart. But in Endgame, spoiler alert, this isn't the trivia spoiler thing in case you didn't know, but there's a scene where we see uh, the hammer actually flying through the air and we're thinking it's going to Thor, but it goes right past him and Captain America ha- holds it in the air. And I'm telling you, I was in the theater when that happened and the theater erupted, like people went nuts. I mean, they loved it. It was probably the loudest that people were in my theater at that moment. And when I was thinking about this idea of worthiness and like even John, the emotion built up into this moment as he's, he, he, as I read to you, just the weight of, of human history and the power of sin just wearing on his shoulders, knowing, man, what is gonna happen for the elder to lean over and say, weep no more. There is one who can open that seal. There is one who is worthy. Can you imagine the eruption that happens in heaven? The the praise that just gets exploded out as they see this story unfolded. Everything we've heard about for generations and thousands of years coming to fruition in this moment as the lion of the tribe of Judah stands before them to open this scroll. What a beautiful picture. And you know what's even interesting is that even as John looks, the lion of tribe of Judah is here, and as he looks, what he sees is a slaughtered lamb. Man, this what a slaughtered lamb! I thought we were talking about a a lion. Now I I I didn't share this in the first service, but if you need to slaughter any animal, you can talk to Thomas Helms, and uh, he will tell you how to slaughter that animal. but in, in this day, if you, if you remember the story of Israel in Egypt, right, under slavery, and Moses let my people go, that whole situation, right, there was a moment where he said, every firstborn is going to die in every house uh, in, in here unless the blood of the lamb is on the doorposts of your house. And so these lambs were sacrificed and given one per family for, for their blood to put on the doorpost of the house to signify that, that they were followers of the Lord. And as the spirit came through and as those firstborn died, the ones that were saved and redeemed were the people of Israel who had the blood of the lamb. As, as Jesus is the lamb, the slaughtered lamb, he is the picture of a once and for all sacrifice for you and I. And and the beauty of even his worthiness in this moment, we see just incredible worthiness is that he is a slaughtered lamb who is the conqueror. The Bible constantly going back to what is a slaughtered lamb. Such a beautiful picture for us that the cross was not a last minute fix to a system that you and I broke with our sin, but it was God's plan from the beginning. Even Isaiah 53, talking about a suffering servant, there's this picture of the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, as Alistair Begg says, by whose blood our sins are cleansed, with whose righteousness we are clothed, and in whose company we will live for all eternity. In the moments that we are reminded of our own unworthiness, the gospel reminds us that only Jesus is worthy. And his power and authority are all we need which is the second and last point, is that he alone is able. 
He alone is able. Let's read verses 11 through 14. Then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. I love Colossians 1 that reminds us that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus has always been and will always be. And in here, his authority is on full display. Throughout scripture, God declares his promises to us and here he makes them good. We can see constantly as God is declaring to his people what he will do. And I love this picture because in this moment, in this chapter, we see everybody in heaven acknowledging the fact that that is absolutely true. We trust so many people that let us down, but only Jesus is the answer. No philosophy or fleeting feeling can actually provide what Jesus does for us through the cross. We put so much stock into other things. We've, we've kind of hacked our way into just uh, so many things in life, right? Like there, there are people wearing bands that tell them when to sleep or when to eat and when to drink, like whatever. Like we, we've, we've found ways to automate our lives and yet we have not looked to the true one answer of our life that Jesus is the only one who has the authority and power. And I know that we're walking through stuff. Uh, listen, I get it that the past four years of my life, I don't really want to repeat at all, even though God's used them. Um, I was this uh, pastor named James Boyce, who was a pastor at a Presbyterian church in Philadelphia, diagnosed with cancer in the year 2000. He was 62 years old, and eight weeks after being diagnosed, he passed away. But just a few weeks before that, in May, he passed away in June, in May, he addressed his congregation. And in the midst of that, he said, if God does something in your life, would you change it? And if you did change it, you'd actually make it worse. It wouldn't be as good. So that's the way we want to accept and move forward. And who knows what God will do. The comfort in our lives it's not that God's gonna give us the million dollars that we want or provide all the comfort, uh, creature comforts that we're used to. The comfort in our lives is knowing that God is still on the throne no matter what you walk through, no matter what pain you're experiencing, no, no matter what challenges you walk in your life, Jesus is on the throne and he is worthy and he has all of the power and authority. Just like these elders and creatures, should we fall at our face and worship him? I heard Paul David Tripp this week. He said, nobody ever says, I've had the three easiest years of my life and I've grown so much. <laughs> God uses that situation to, to help us grow deeper in our relationship with him, to help us walk with him. And in this moment, can we be reminded of his own Worthiness. The word worship, the first is really taken from two, two old words, and the first one means worth. It's ascribing worth to the one who is owed it. In this moment, can we ascribe to God all of the worship that he deserves? And in the way that we live our lives, even as we read and finish this book out with all, all of the craziness that is to come, when we focus on the fact that Jesus is the center of this story and I want him to be the center of my life. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I thank you so much for the love that you show us day in and day out, for the um, repeated blessing of the cross in my life that I need to be reminded of daily, of the sacrifice that you've made for us, the fact that you are our lamb once and for all, sacrificed on our behalf through the cross, but conquering death, and even in this moment, as we read the, the picture, beautiful picture in heaven, God, thank you for being worthy and for being all powerful and capable and able. And in our lives, we know we can focus on our situation so much. God, help us to just move our eyes to you. Help us to direct our hearts 
towards you. For the person in this room that's walking through just a painful part in their life, whether it be physical or emotional or what, spiritual, whatever the case may be, God, will, will you allow them to fix their eyes on you? Will you give them the strength they need and remind them daily of the love that you have for them? God, for the person in this room that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray that today would be the day that they would know that, that they would decide to follow the Lamb who has given their life for them. God, help us in this room to even now glorify your name and lift your name above all else. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.